Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Nick Messino. I'm the president CEO of the Gwinnett Chamber. We're very excited uh, for you to join us. Uh, we are uh, hosting this call um, with uh, our, our actual IT vendor, which is Rocket IT. And before I introduce our uh, speaker, I want to just real quickly let you know a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we're here and we're still operating. The majority of our staff, probably like you, are operating remotely. Uh, we do have a crew between six and 10 people here at the chamber. Obviously, we have been for weeks following all the CDC and WHO guidelines. Um, and I know that you all are as well. Um, obviously, at four o'clock on Friday, Gwinnett County and all 16 municipalities um, uh, announced an order for essential workers only. Um, and that's can be very confusing. Uh, and I want you to know that at GwinnettChamber.org, on the main screen, you can click to a resource page that has the order, the Gwinnett County order, which is very, very similar to all of the 16 city orders. Also, uh, the Homeland Security uh, resource page on what's essential, uh, the county and city ordinances list, a, a pretty comprehensive list. Uh, but I would also have you uh, also look at the Homeland Security list that's linked in the Q&A or the frequently asked questions. You may have already determined you're essential uh, and you're nervous for your employees. Uh, and I would highly recommend that if you go to GwinnettChamber.org on the frequently asked questions number five, there's a PDF of a sample letter that you can use yourself uh, and you can use for your employees. Uh, that would be a very helpful thing. Um, there's also a lot of uh, helpful questions and answers. Um, we basically went live uh, and we've had for the most part a 24 hour call center since uh, four o'clock last Friday. We've received over 500 inquiries via the call center uh, and also emails and text messages. And uh, what I have found is that people uh, are just have a lot of anxiety right now. And they're just not sure. And they just need to talk through, are they essential or not? What that looks like. We've received about 10% of the calls are really just personal calls and no one else is answering their phone. So uh, we have been there for anybody that's willing to call, chamber member or not. Um, but we've also two weeks ago rolled out a portfolio of digital networking and learning opportunities for our membership, uh, for our specific constituents. We had one last week just for Chairman's Club members, uh, but most of them have been open to all general members. Um, and this is another one of those. And we want to thank uh, Rocket IT for their ongoing support. So uh, without further ado, it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, not only a trusted um, vendor, um, but also a friend of ours, Eric Henderson, VP of Technology at Rocket IT, uh, who's been supporting us for probably over a decade. Um, and so, Eric, thank you for presenting this today and taking yeah. it over, sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm not coming to you live from the Gwinnett Chamber. I'm coming to you live from my guest bedroom in uh, lovely Beaufort, Georgia. Um, Rocket IT has been working from home for about two weeks now. And uh, we have been working very diligently long before that two week time period uh, on the topic of business continuity. And so when we originally put this content together, our original focus was, okay, what is the technology people need to get up and running very quickly? Because there are many businesses that are essential that could be done from home, but they just don't have the stuff ready. And as the planning and evolution of this entire situation around the pandemic developed, we realized, okay, this is going to be more of a long-term thing. And so we're going to start out by talking a little bit about the context and framework for all this, and then we'll go into some specific technology considerations, and then we will talk about uh, some more long-term things. So, um, okay. So what is the goal? The goal is uh, what is the right balance uh, being able to work and not putting my employees at any sort of risk. And so we're going to talk a lot about information work and physical work. I think this is a fairly uh, easily understood concept. Basically, information work is anything that does not require you to physically operate a piece of machinery, uh, interact with a customer, interact with a vendor, uh, put something together that you ship, any sort of logistics work like that. So. As an example, uh, I can give you how this looks at Rocket IT. So Rocket IT is an IT services firm. That means the vast majority of work we do involves a person sitting in a computer 
manipulating that computer in some way. So they might be remotely working with a client. They might be working with a computer that is their own personal computer. They might be connecting to some sort of cloud technology and, and modifying it there. So you might say, oh, no big deal. Rocket IT can just work from home. No big problem. But the issue is that we do actually have physical work to our uh, to what we do. Uh, as an example, we deploy desktops, laptops, printers, servers, UPSs, networking equipment. And so it's a pretty big issue uh, if our office isn't open and our clients' offices aren't open because our clients have critical needs for that. And so the the way I want you to think about this is in my organization, how much work is information? How much work is physical? Is there any physical work that I've been, that I can do without? Or is there any physical work that I could do once a week or once a month or every other week? That sort of thing. Um, okay. So in practice, there are three types of businesses. Every business has to fit into one of these categories. Uh, there are some businesses that are 100% informational. Uh, the, the businesses that uh, fit in this category generally would be something like an engineering firm. Uh, the best way I've ever heard it described is that there is a large class of people that all they do is sell PDFs. So lawyers sell PDFs, engineers sell PDFs, uh, other types of professional services firms. Often all they're really doing is taking their expertise and their knowledge and their systems and their best practices, putting it into uh, written language and then sending a PDF. And that PDF could be worth many thousands of dollars, depending on what's included. Uh, and then you have businesses that are physical only. So restaurants are physical, warehouses are physical, uh, most manufacturing facilities are entirely physical. And then I think the most businesses fall somewhere in between. As I've already explained with Rocket IT, Rocket IT is hybrid. We're probably 90% informational, 10% physical. Um, some of our manufacturing clients are probably 90% physical and 10% informational. They do have some employees that uh, do drafting work, estimating, engineering, uh, sales planning, that sort of work. And that work can all be done from home. And so they've made accommodations to, to, uh, to handle that. Um, okay. So that's, that's the introductory statement. Uh, let's talk about the short-term considerations for working from home. So as Nick mentioned, Gwinnett County and the 16 cities in Gwinnett issued a uh, shelter at home order, and it made specific provisions for classifying what a business is to be declared essential or not essential. Even within that order, even if you are essential, uh, I'm sure if you work for a business that's essential or you uh, own a business that's essential, you still are having a lot of pressure for those employees to work from home just because socially and based on what Governor Kemp has said, uh, that's really where you need to be. And so you may have to be thinking about what kind of technology do you need? So uh, Rocket IT believes very strongly in a model of operational maturity. And so operational maturity is a measure of how sophisticated a given technology or process is. It's rated on a one to five scale. It was originally developed by the Department of Defense to evaluate the disaster preparedness of various government agencies. And so Everything I'm about to describe here is being measured on a scale of one to five in operational maturity. So uh, if somebody wants to work from home and they've never worked from home, there's rough four ways that they can do that in terms of what physical device they use. One, they can use a work laptop. And uh, if you have laptops and your employees already have laptops and they already take them home, this is a non-issue for you. Many of our clients, it, it didn't mean anything that they had to work from home because they already were already very work from home friendly. Um, and the reason this is the best case scenario is uh, control and consistency. So there's an incredible amount of disruption in the world right now. There's an incredible amount of chaos. And so if your employees don't have to think, oh, what's my password to log into this computer? Or how do I power this computer on? Or how do I connect the wireless on this computer? If they don't have to think about any of those things, it's going to be easier for them to work. Also, from a security perspective, they have all the same suite of security systems installed on their work laptop that they would in the office. And so, as we'll see on some of these other options down the line, that can be an issue. Um, 
down the line from there. And I was actually very surprised at the number of our clients that wanted to do this. Um, because work laptops is what every IT guy across the entire earth was saying was the best option, the world supply of business quality laptops, laptops in the $18 to $1,500 range, went to completely zero stock. So once there were no laptops available, uh, employers were full of ingenuity and said, you know what, employees, take your desktops, haul it home. And so we had an incredible number of employees that went to the office, got their desktop, their monitor, their speaker, their mouse, the computer, all the cables. They dragged it to their house. They dragged it to whichever room had their Wi-Fi router in it, and they plugged it all in, and they got us to help them configure it so that it was on the network. Now, is this as good as a laptop? No. This this was fairly disruptive. You're probably looking at a three to five hour loss of productivity for each employee that's doing this. But if you couldn't get a laptop, then, I mean, what else are you going to do? I, I guess that that's the next best option. Okay. Uh, third option would be a tablet. So when I say tablet here, I'm talking about a uh, Amazon Fire tablet or a iPad. I'm not talking about uh, like a Surface type device. Surface type device would be more like a laptop. But for some employees, particularly employees that particularly uh, spend most of their time in meetings or on phone calls, it is entirely possible to do their full work workflow from an iPad uh, or a um, Samsung tablet. The capabilities of the devices have merged very closely to what a laptop can do. And so really the core problem is just ergonomics and access to a keyboard. Okay, the fourth, op fourth option, and this is the lowest operational maturity would be to use a home computer. Now, why am I being a buzzkill on home computers? The problem with home computers is that from a uh, from the view of control and security, there is no way that you can ensure that a home computer is secure. There's no way you can ensure that the other members of your employee's household um, aren't downloading things they shouldn't be onto that computer and causing a potential security breach. So Best practice is you make every effort available to offer laptops, desktops, and tablets purchased by the employer instead of home PCs. Uh, when you start using home PCs, you're basically introducing risk to the situation, and you really don't want a global pandemic to be occurring and you to have a major security breach at the same time. And by allowing home computers onto your network, and by allowing employees to use those home computers to connect to your corporate data and download that data and sync up to that data and type in your passwords on that home computer, you're exposing the organization to risk. Okay, so uh, same idea within uh, operational maturity. Uh, now that we have a piece of hardware at the employee's home, we need to make a uh, provision for them to be able to connect remotely. So generally speaking, there's three different ways to do that. Uh, see these more as three different categories and not exactly specific solutions named here. Uh, the first one, uh, if you've worked in a larger organization or an organization that has a traditional network, which means premise servers located in an office or a data center, it's almost always going to involve a VPN and then potentially a terminal server. So if you've ever used the program Remote Desktop Connection on your computer, or if you used a Cisco VPN, a WatchGuard VPN, a Fortinet VPN, a SonicWall VPN, uh, this is the traditional way of doing it. And for many, many, many users trying to connect at once, it works great. Uh, the largest companies in the world still using some form of technology similar to this. Um, next option would be uh, so under a VPN situation, your computer is at your house, you connect to the office, and then you connect up to that office and you do all the work from a terminal server. Now, let's say, well, March 31st, I don't have a terminal server, Eric, what am I going to do about that? Well, that really depends on what type of files you are accessing. So if you are a graphic designer, let's say, and your files are very large. So you're looking at large video files, large uh, images, large audio files. It's not going to work real well 
for you to try and pull that file back and forth between your house and the office. Um, one of the issues with using a VPN is that the download speed is often very slow. And the reason it's slow is because your home internet connection and the office internet connection are bottlenecks and all the security software involved in keeping that connection secure slows it all down. So if you've ever worked from home and thought, man, I wish this VPN was faster, it might be because the types of files that you're accessing don't work very well over a VPN. Um, probably the most classic example of this is QuickBooks. Uh, if you try and use QuickBooks over a VPN, you are guaranteed to have a terrible experience. It can take as long as 30 to 60 seconds per transaction to try and do that over a VPN. So that brings us to our second option here, using either log me in or go to my PC. Uh, under this model, you would leave a computer in the office, and then from a work computer at your house, you would look at the desktop of that computer. And by doing that, you're still doing all your work in the office, you're just viewing that from, from your home. And this is best, as mentioned, for graphic designers, engineers, anyone accessing large files. Okay, and then the third option, and this is, Honestly, if you started a business in the last five years, it's very likely that your organization is entirely focused on this anyway, is using some sort of cloud application. So what I'm talking about here is Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive, Box.net, any sort of system like this where it syncs your files. iCloud would be an example as well. Um, these solutions aren't using a server at your office. These solutions sync the file between your computer and then up to the cloud. And by doing that, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're at your office or at your house or anywhere else. Okay, next, let's talk about phones. Uh, I think everything I've shared so far, if you've been working from home for a week or two, you've probably already had to figure out. And if you're starting to work from home now that you're in the process of figuring out, the next thing that usually comes up is how, what am I gonna do about phone calls? And um, depending on the type of organization you are, this could be a complete non-issue or this could be absolutely critical to what you do. It really depends on how your organization processes phone calls. Uh, we have some clients that their phone system could go down and they wouldn't even notice because they only get one or two calls a day. And we have other clients where their phone is literally what keeps them in business. And if that stopped working, then in the line. So uh, the same concepts around operational maturity uh, apply here. There are roughly three different ways to handle this. Uh, one, if you have a phone system where you don't really know how to get support for it, you don't know how to log into it, you don't know anything like that, uh, you can call your phone company and say, will you forward all calls that come to my business's main number to a specific cell phone? Uh, this would usually work well if you have very low call volume and that the nature of those calls all are going to one or two different people. You're going to run into some challenges when if that person is expected to act as an operator and route calls from this person to this person, and conference this person in, none of that's really going to work very well. Uh, you would just be forwarding this number to make sure that you don't drop calls. I actually uh, called a restaurant last week to see if they were open and it forwarded to someone's cell phone and it went to like their personal cell phone message. Is it the most professional thing in the world? No, not exactly, but it will cover you in a pinch and if that's the only option you have, it will work. Um, second would be if you have a premise phone system. So similar to having premise servers, you could have a premise phone system and depending on the age and function of that system, it is possible to route specific extensions to specific cell phones. And so you would keep your business cell phone or your business phone system operational. And then if it needed to route when you dialed, say, my extension, it would ring directly to my cell phone. From the outside caller's perspective, this is just as good as what you had before. And then a cloud phone system, very similar to the cloud file system. Uh, the cloud phone system doesn't care where you are in the world as long as you have internet. So all places are the same. So if you use 3CX, Ring Central, Grand Central, uh, Grasshopper, Microsoft Teams, all of these have built in phone systems and they're not particularly worried about where you are uh, to get calls. Um, okay. The, the next consideration, and I would say this. At Rocket IT, we, we really felt this about one weekend. So uh, before the pandemic, various 
team members at Rocket IT would work from home for a day, a couple of days, like maybe work would be do, being done at their house or they'd have to stay home with a child or they might just not be a little under the weather and they would stay home for a day or two and it wouldn't be any big issue. But the issue is once you start working home from home permanently, uh, it can be kind of a lonely experience. Uh, I've certainly experienced this myself, obviously not being able to really go out anywhere because of the pandemic has made that worse. And so you want to make sure that your team members morale stays up. And one way to do that is giving them the tools they need to be able to easily connect with each other. So when I say connect, I don't mean, oh, let's have a scheduled meeting at 1030 a.m. on Tuesday every week. I mean, hey, can I just hop over and do a quick video chat with you and just check in and see how your kids are doing, see how your uh, spouse is doing, uh, see how you're holding up under the pandemic, see if you need anything. Um, our CEO, Matt, uh, many of you know him, uh, has done an excellent job with this. He'll sometimes just call over to me and check in, see how I'm doing. There's no, there's no meeting agenda. There's no action item or anything he really wants to chat about. So uh, I've got a couple options listed on the screen here. Uh, these aren't necessarily listed in operational maturity other than using only email and phone is probably the lowest operational, operationally mature uh, issue here. So uh, if you have a team that isn't likely to use video chat or just is already working in a fairly disjointed way, then you probably could get away with that. The rest of the world has standardized on these other three platforms, uh, Microsoft Teams, so this is part of the Office 365, now Microsoft 365 platform. Uh, Rocket IT uses this pretty substantially. I've already been on three Teams calls, or yeah, three Teams calls and video calls this morning. Uh, we do a huddle at 8 a.m. and then I've had a couple other meetings. Uh, the, we'll call it uh, open source, more Google friendly alternative is called Slack. Uh, you may have heard of Slack. Slack is a uh, collaboration platform. Started out just as chat, so you could do one-to-many chat, you could do one-on-one -on -one chat, you could have small teams in there, but they have expanded to include audio, video, integrations with pretty much every major software platform. And then third, uh, Zoom. Zoom is generally best served for uh, more formal meetings, I would say. Uh, it has a little more overhead than using Teams or Slack. With Teams or Slack, I can one-click uh, on, a, on a button, and it will initiate a video call either with a whole team or an individual, and I'll be off and running. Zoom has it's like more like two to four clicks to get that done. It's also, interestingly, the platform we're on right now. And so it's well-served for something like a webinar where uh, we want to do one-to-many communication. Okay. So. We've talked through technology, we talked through hardware, remote access, file systems, phone systems, and collaboration tools. Now we want to kind of shift gears into long-term considerations. And what do I, what do I mean when I say long-term? So this uh, COVID-19, you know, began in late December uh, and then gradually made its way into Italy and uh, South Korea and Germany and the United Kingdom and then early March became a very quickly rising concern in the United States. And a core question that people have been asking pretty much since the minute stuff started shutting down is when is this going to be open? Like, why can't somebody just tell me what day I get to go back to the office? What day do I get to go back to having concerts or going to Disney World or going to festivals or anything like that? And the answer is uh, no one really knows, but I will say that I spent a lot of time considering this and have asked a lot of very well-informed people. And I think most of the world is kind of settled in for all of April and all of May. So putting us onto a June 1st, uh, kind of get back into it. Um, I this was, this was kind of a hard fact for me. Uh, it, it occurred to me that I'd been working from home two weeks and that there were 10 weeks to go, or I, I should say two weeks and then a total of eight more weeks. So a total of 10 weeks, which means arguably we're 20% into this. Am I qualified to say that it's exactly going to be June 1st? Not really. I, I don't think anyone has a, a great model that says exactly when it will be. 
I will say that the decisions of the businesses that I interact with seem to be leaning in this direction. Some of our clients, uh, some of the organizations sending me promotions seem to lean towards June 1st is really when it's going to be. And so while what I've shared so far in this webinar will help you get the technology up and running to work from home, uh, there are some other considerations that come up that the longer this goes on, the more important these things become. So let, let's talk about some of those. So security. Uh, let's talk about phishing. Phishing with a PH. You can see it written there on the screen. So uh, phishing with a PH in a IT context basically means sending you a form of communication that relies on and preys on your trust and tries to trick you into doing something that will harm you. Almost always uh, some sort of financial transaction, some sort of download that will harm your computer and your corporate network, or giving up your password to something so they can use it for further attacks. Uh, phishing has been very popular in the last five to seven years. Uh, many of the clients Rocket IT works with engage in testing. So what we do in these tests is we send a fake email that looks like a phishing email that's actually harmless, and we keep track of which employees click it and which employees don't. And if you click it, then you are reckoned as a clicker, and you really, really don't want to be a clicker. Um, someone who clicks phishing emails is roughly the same type of security hazard as a security guard that leaves the door unlocked or leaves the alarm off in the building that you're asking them to secure. Uh, it is the digital equivalent of that. Why am I bringing up phishing now? Well, uh, the organization we work with to do phishing testing, I had a call with them late last week, and they said they made a fake phishing email that imitated the IRS sending out the stimulus checks associated with the stimulus bill that passed last week. And they, they just did a test and sent it out to their clients and said, let's see how many of them click this. They had 80% of people clicking it. So essentially that means if an attacker is capable of getting a phishing email that looks like the IRS's government check, noting that the IRS is not going to email you a check, uh, then you have an incredibly high risk if your employees are not made aware of that. And so um, these people are criminals and they are very enterprising, they are very smart, and they are not above whatsoever taking uh, taking advantage of people's fear and taking advantage of the chaos to get their attacks onto your computer. So uh, if you hear nothing else, looking into phishing testing, looking into these tests around um, either COVID-19 or the stimulus or something related to that is probably the biggest thing you could do to boost your security uh, during this time. Uh, secondly, Regular patching, we want to make sure that computers stay up to date. Uh, one of the many thorns in the side of many IT systems administrators is when computers are at home, it's very difficult for those IT administrators to patch them because they don't have control into them. So we've got to make sure that just because we're working from home doesn't mean we can uh, let patching slide. And then third, this is me just harping on something I've already brought up, but home computers, we really got to keep them off of corporate networks. You have no controls in place whatsoever about either patching or phishing testing. So um, as the world's laptop supply improves a little bit, strongly recommended to migrate users with home PCs to uh, corporately on PCs. Um, next, uh, virtualized meetings. So if you're in any sort of business where you sell and you uh, do that via a meeting or a, a written proposal, you probably have already had to figure out ways to do this right now. Uh, many organizations would have preferred or only done business via a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, our organization is, is one such of those. We wouldn't present a major proposal over email, and we try not to do it over meeting if we can help it. We would want to do that in person, but uh, that's not how the world is right now. Uh, even if you still prefer that right now, many of your clients are not going to be willing to meet with you. They're not going to even understand why you're asking, uh, especially if their office is closed. So um, you really need to establish a framework for how to digitally generate proposals. Uh, we use a system called Proposify. Fantastic. 
it's inexpensive. I think we pay something like uh, $100 per month for the entirety of Rocket IT to be able to generate proposals. Um, those proposals go out to clients. They look very professional. It has these signature capabilities built into it. It lets you know when the clients viewed the proposal. Works great. And then you need to establish a platform to for your uh, all of your employees that are client facing to be able to do meetings. Uh, and you want to keep it to one platform just to reduce confusion. Uh, I will say, and you should look at Zoom's stock price for evidence of this, but the world seems to have pretty well uh, standardized onto Zoom. Certainly there are sections of employees that use WebEx, GoToMeeting, Amazon Chime, Google Hangouts, even in some cases, uh, Skype for Business. But if you send somebody a Zoom link, the vast majority of business employees already have it on their computer and they don't even really have to think about it. It's just something, it's not even a roadblock to doing business. It's something that's very easily going to be understood and accepted, and you're not going to have a lot of issues with audio because it might be the 50th Zoom call they've had that week. Okay, uh, maintenance of networks. So uh, if you have servers at your office and your office is closed, you sadly still have to maintain those servers, which means IT people probably still need to get access to those servers and they still need a way to uh, access them. And so many of the problems we're describing and trying to mitigate here are things that could have happened anyway, but are just a little more annoying or a little more troublesome if they happen during this pandemic. Um, Rocket IT, as an example, has severely limited how many engineers we're sending on site. Uh, for one, many of our client offices are closed, and for two, um, our employees have a valid concern to say, hey, if I don't need to go on site, I'm, I don't see the need for me to go on site at all. So we're only sending engineers on site generally after hours and generally during times when uh, our clients' employees are not in high quantities and congregating in those offices. Uh, second item here is, if I am correct, and this goes another eight weeks, I mean, we already know that the president has extended the social distancing guidelines through April 30th, so that's at least another four weeks, 30 days. Um, it's probably worth checking in with your team members to see if they're getting their work done efficiently. And it may be worth uh, reimbursing them to temporarily boost their internet speeds at their home. So as you probably know, uh, Spectrum, Xfinity, and AT&T offer a, a wide range of packages. And it could be worth bouncing an employee's internet from, say, the $29 a month plan up to the $49 a month plan so that they can work efficiently. That extra $20 a month uh, is probably totally worth any extra work that they could accomplish. Okay, uh, get comfortable. Uh, this, this rocket on here. Uh, I also, I want to give a shout out. Uh, our marketing specialist, Chris Swenson, he's on the call right now. He put together all these slides, and I just, I love him. I think he did a great job. Okay, uh, get comfortable. So, home peripherals. So, we talked about employees taking their work laptops home. Uh, the issue with a work laptop is that it's not really built for sitting in front of all day. It's usually a little too low. You have to bend your neck down like this to look down at the screen. And so, most Corporate monitors put the monitors up on the wall so that you can have your head at an even position and look directly at the monitor. So if your employees have multiple monitors, you should strongly consider whether they can at a, you know, time when it's just them, go to the office, grab a monitor, grab a keyboard, grab a speaker. We, the way we're structuring this is we just ask them to email their supervisor what the model numbers of the equipment that they took not because we think they're going to steal it, just to make sure that we keep track of all of our assets. Um, and we also want to make sure that once this is all over, that they bring bring all that stuff back. Um, and then secondly, and I mentioned this earlier about Matt, but, you know, check in on, on, on your teammates. Uh, one of the core benefits of having an office is that you can uh, you can read the body language and facial expressions of the people around you. So if they're stressed, or if they're angry, or if they're having a hard time, or they're 
despairing of whatever problem they're working on, you can easily tell that. That is not at all clear when you are working entirely remotely. Um, you have to read tone into text messages, and sometimes getting on video with them might be the only way to, uh, to connect. Now, that is all multiplied by the nature of where the news is right now. Um, as the number of cases worldwide in the United States continues to grow, it is generating a huge amount of anxiety in people, um, both economically, their health, they're just not knowing exactly what's going to happen. So strongly recommended. Just I, I think the way uh, our CEO Matt Hyatt does it is he's trying to connect with every employee. Feels like about twice a week. Um, he either chats them, texts them, or just does a quick video call. Just asks how they're doing, make sure that they they need anything. Um, he would have done this if we were in the office. He would have just walked around and said hello to everyone, see if there's anything on anyone's mind. But you have to be far more intentional about it when you are digitally connected because there's no, there's no easy way to do that inside of a chat program. You have to be very specific to, to go in there and do that. Okay. Um, finally, uh, engaging with people. So, uh, the case of Rocket IT has been that in the last two weeks, I've probably worked 60 or 70 hours each of the last two weeks. Um, I'm among the most popular people on our client's contact list because there's a huge number of consideration, basically everything I just said for the last 20 or 30 minutes, that every single one of our clients wanted to work out all at once. And so for us, at least at this point, uh, business is booming, so to speak. Um, we're not doing a lot of capital projects, but we have an incredibly high demand on the services that we provide. I am fully aware of the fact that for some of you and for some of your clients and your vendors, uh, that is not the case. So if you do business, obviously, with restaurants or any sort of company that is primarily driven by events or conferences, uh, they do not have that same uh, demand on their services right now. And so I've seen it tremendously on social media already, but just consider how you might promote or help those other businesses. Like if you know that you're going to do business with uh, vendor X after this is all over, consider trying to work out a, a contract with them that says, hey, once this event is all over, once the pandemic has cooled off and uh, everything's good, I want to do business with you. I want to go ahead and get a contract drafted. I want to have a proposal for those services. Um, you know, take a look at doing that. And then Figure out if you can use social media to promote what they do as well. I've been incredibly impressed with how uh, businesses in the Gwinnett community, as I mentioned, I live in Buford, uh, businesses in the Gwinnett community have started adapting to deal with this. I mean, the, the emails I get from restaurants in terms of contact lists or touchless delivery and curbside service and all this different sort of thing has been incredible. And if you care about these businesses, then you need to do something about it so that when this is all over, they're still there for you to enjoy them. Uh, secondly, uh, community groups. So the Gwinnett community, particularly the Community Foundation for Northeast Georgia, has uh, put together a website called GwinnettCares.org. Uh, it is a fantastic resource. Paige Havens uh, put that together and has been promoting it on social media widely. Uh, secondly, I personally created a Facebook group called Gwinnett slash Coronavirus Community Assistance. Um, it's just a resource for people to connect. I've already seen some wonderful things that the people in that group have done for each other in terms of, hey, my kid doesn't have a laptop and can't do digital learning through Gwinnett County Public Schools because, uh, you know, you need a laptop to be able to log into that. And they were, and then the group was able to source laptops for that person. And then third, uh, foodfinder.us. Okay. All right, let's see questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, I see several of you have already done this. Um, you can email marketing at rocketit.com or you can come down to the bottom of Zoom and go to chat. Um, I'm trying to see if there are any questions yet. Um, hey, Eric, it's uh, Colleen. Hi, Colleen. Hey. How are you doing? So I did get a question in the Q&A box from Greg Cantrell, and he was asking, do you have a preference between log me in and go to my PC? 
Sure. Uh, thanks for the question, Greg. Uh, preferences around log me in and go to my PC? No, not really. Um, I think it functionality wise, they are extraordinarily similar. This product has become commoditized over the last 10 years. So really it just comes down to the question of how many computers that you want to access remotely because they have very strange pricing plans where it's like one to two computers is $20, but two to 10 computers is 60 and you know, 50 computers is like $600 or something like that. And some of them have monthly or annual commitments. So I would focus entirely on, on the economics and duration in which you intend to use this product, noting that even if the pandemic does only last an additional month, you may still want to use that product into the next couple of years. It could be something that you keep in your, uh, in your toolkit to make sure that you have remote access even beyond the pandemic. Okay. Um, if you do have any other further questions, you can submit them to marketing at rocketit.com. Uh, this webinar also was recorded and so we will be sending a link out to all uh, registered parties uh, in, a, in a couple of days. So uh, that's all that I have. Uh, Nick, do you want to hop on to any parting words? Let me just say that this was incredibly helpful. Appreciate your sound advice. Thank you for being there uh, for the Gwinnett community and hope you and your family and coworkers stay healthy and safe. Thanks, Eric.